Hello everyone and welcome to the Comexis Cast. All the news you need to know from our inbox to yours. Today we're talking about some surprisingly positive statistics about Facebook mid-roll ads. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Matthew McGordy, the videographer and podcaster here at Comexis. And today I'm joined by the lead strategist at Comexis, Philip Brooks. Hello. So today we're talking about Facebook mid-roll ads. So for those of you who don't know, um, Facebook mid-roll ads and mid-roll ads in general are ads that play in the middle of a video that you are watching. Really cleverly named. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, specifically with Facebook uh, mid-roll ads, we're going to be talking about their ads break program. Uh, so some publishers took place uh, took part in this ads break program. Uh, basically, the rules were it had to be a video that was at least three minutes long and the ad would not appear for at least the first minute. So a viewer could get a minute into a three minute video and then see an ad, or they could get two minutes into a video and then see an ad, stuff like that. Uh, so what's really important to think about is, and keep in mind when we talk about these numbers is that mid-roll ads tend to be the most annoying and intrusive ads. <laughs> Typically, right? I mean, pretty much by definition, they're intrusive mm -hmm. because they happen in the middle of the content that you're watching. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we've talked about in the past uh, that a lot of the times, you know, pre roll ads tend to be really nice because, you know, you get through the content, kind of a little mini gate, and then uh, you're off to the races. So hopefully. Eating your vegetables before you get to the good part. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so, launched last March, this program, uh, there were six publishers that uh, Sahil Patel and Digiday mm -hmm. spoke to about their successes with this program. Um, so so in 2007, uh, it didn't do particularly great. Uh, a lot of these publishers weren't really seeing fantastic numbers, but a lot of that has changed in 2018. Um, so I've got a couple notes on that. So six publishers participated in the ads break program. They said they are seeing more revenue come in from the ad product this year. One publisher said it's mid-roll and revenue grew 10 to 40%, uh, depending on the page, uh, from the first quarter to the second quarter of 2018, and is on track to make more than $10 million from the mid-roll ads this year. A second publisher said Facebook mid-roll ads on a pace to be, quote, double-digit million-dollar business for the publisher this year. Wow. And a third publisher said their Facebook mid-roll ad revenue will be in the low seven figures in 2018. And all three of these publishers are among the top Facebook video makers in terms of monthly video views. Uh, one executive uh, from that from the third publisher uh, said it was good progress, but it's, quote, it's still not a huge leap considering where our video views are at, and it's still not at the level you would imagine it be. So clearly their, um, their video view levels are quite high, and sort of the return on investment they're getting seems a lot lower, but it's significantly higher than what you're seeing. Yeah. they were seeing in 2017. Sure. Um, so that's really, really interesting. <laughs> Obviously, one of the things and one of the biggest comparisons from Facebook uh, mid-roll ads would be YouTube and the revenue that you're getting from YouTube. So we talked mm -hmm. previously in a podcast, you can find that also in the blog description down below, uh, about YouTube adding more ads. And now we see here Facebook, however it is that they're changing their algorithm, um, we're seeing mid rods be even more successful. So I think it kind of goes into this, and, and you feel free to um, um, double back me on this, or mm -hmm. not double back me, disagree with me, or mm -hmm. agree with me. Well, you know, Phil, you can do whatever you I, want yeah, this thank podcast. You, thanks for the permission. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I think it's we're in this sort of interesting uh, space where, given the length of the content we're beginning to see on these platforms, that you can have more ads, where previously the thought process was, you know, mid-roll ads, intrusive, really annoying, people hate them, but we're no longer seeing a mid-roll ad on a minute long video, mm -hmm. we're seeing them on three minutes. In the case of YouTube, seven to like 14 minutes. So what do you think about that? Bob? Well, I think first off, I think YouTube Red was a great use case scenario for mm -hmm. them to look at because the longer form content people were more willing to, you know, A, it, 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 it engendered people to decide, hey, I want to pay for this service just so I can stop seeing these ads. Mm -hmm. But it also, you know, created kind of a, 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 a it showed that the, the, that there, people would still continue watching with longer, longer form content even if there were mid-roll ads in it. Mm -hmm. um, I think Facebook, in general, because of the way that the, the, the infinite scrolling possibilities makes it a little bit less likely for people to stick around when a mid-roll pops up. But um, you know, for me, that's personally surprising to hear the numbers that they've gotten. Because you know, I, I can tell you a lot of times, I'm just if something starts with a mid-roll ad, I'm just like, and I just mm -hmm. keep going. But YouTube, I can certainly see it being a little more 
you know, I can, I can see why that would work a little better on YouTube because you're kind of stuck in that frame. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and one of the things that is involved with this is it's not just the in-feed ones. It's also Facebook Watch. But you could also argue, you know, how successful is Facebook Watch in comparison to, say, YouTube. I actually have numbers for that, kind of. <laughs> um, so at VidCon, Facebook announced that it would expand mid-roll. Um, they also um, said that time spent inside Watch had increased by 900% since the beginning of the year, uh, which hasn't said overall how much time that actually mm. is, but it is a significant increase. Um, I personally almost never use it. I probably couldn't even find it except on my phone because they have a nice little icon there. Mm. Um, so it's one of those things where, you know, of course people are using Facebook Watch, but we have, it, it's pennies to peanuts probably compared to how much YouTube is sure. actually used, especially right. um, given the type of content. So an, an, another piece was, you know, some of these publishers were talking about, well, how much do I make on Facebook? How much do I make on YouTube from these ads? So one publisher projected that $264 uh, were acquired for every million video views on Facebook, and then it expects about 2,200 for every million video views on YouTube. Uh, so in that case, uh, Facebook video is, view is worth about 12% of a YouTube video view. Obviously, I think in the future, if this growth continues, that mm. will obviously fluctuate and change. Um, but I also wouldn't say that's necessarily a bad, certainly well, not a sure. bad, a bad number. But I think we also need to keep in mind too that you know to to kind of put those thing, two things together and create a sort of an all things being equal mm -hmm. comparison isn't necessarily the way that anybody in in the marketing field yeah. sees those the, sees those channels because. You know, we, we see them as having very different audiences and very mm -hmm. different purposes. So to kind of do a dollars to donuts comparison between the two, you, you're going to get more efficient on one platform or another, especially if you're doing your audience segmentation correctly. Mm -hmm. So sure. keep in mind that, you know, the, 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 that number, while, so, while it sounds great, you know, it, it, they're not, you're not comparing apples and oranges there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Um, one final thing I wanted to mention, because the last podcast we did when we were talking about YouTube uh, and them increasing ad numbers was that we talked about how it's kind of moving towards almost a traditional yeah. TV avenue. I won't say exactly because the ads on YouTube are typically much shorter, right? Um, and when we think about traditional TV, um, we, you know, every like probably 11 minutes or so, there's almost four minutes of ad. Right. In fact, I have, a, I have a quote that says that. So, uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to read the quote in a second, mm. but. Um, I, I'm almost wondering if that is going to be slowly beginning to become more acceptable. I mean, I, I mentioned it in the YouTube podcast, um, and I'm now that I'm seeing some of these numbers, I'm thinking, you know, maybe mineral ads on select long-form video content aren't nearly as toxic as one would think they are. Um, so I have a quote mm. um, from an exec of a top Facebook video publisher. He said, or they said, actually, I don't know their gender. They said, quote, TV has four minutes of ad time for every 11 minutes of content. Facebook Watch had a fraction of a fraction of that. They're going to expand ad, ad load, but in the short term, they're inching into it so they don't piss off users and create mm. scarcity for the inventory as it opens up. Um, so they this exec, and I would also agree with this, mm -hmm. I can definitely see them going towards a sure. more traditional TV avenue. Obviously, I don't think we're going to get yeah. eight minutes of ads. I, I, think, I think the important thing there in, in that mm -hmm. statement is to remember that you know the implied value of the content mm -hmm. you're seeing on television because of the production costs and the sunken costs that are created. Mm -hmm. You know, People are more willing to accept that because they realize that they need to monetize this. I think if somehow you're going to see a huge uh, you know, leap forward in the production value of the content you're seeing on Facebook and not seeing, you know, the horrible mm -hmm. quality content you're seeing now, you know, video-wise and things like that. You know, people may be more willing to accept that kind of, um, you know, monetization model. But, you know, for, you know, your uncle's backyard <laughs> barbecue yeah. or, you know, somebody taking a GIF and making it into a video to make sure that you stay on the page a little bit longer, that's, you know... No, you're 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 absolutely right. I, I completely agree. I mean, obviously, we're talking about publishers, so for the most part, I would assume their content is somewhat higher quality. Sure. Obviously, these publishers weren't named, but I can take a pretty good guess mm. um, that their content is probably sure higher it's quality. Not, it's not race book run by Mark Puckerberg. <laughs> no, I'm not, just, okay. You know, I have a distinct feeling it's not. But okay. Thank you, Philip. Okay. Uh, so that's it, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Comexus Cast. Philip, thank you for joining me adjacent to the table today. My pleasure. If you'd like to listen to more of us, you can check us out on TuneIn, Stitcher, the iTunes Podcast, or the Google. 
Play Music Store and the Google Podcast app, as well as on SoundCloud. And if you'd like to watch us in full, you can check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and IGTV. And if you'd like to get nice little snippets sent through your social media feed, you can check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and also on LinkedIn. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and have a great day.